Okay, I would like to welcome you all to this um, EIP webinar on how to improve animal behavior through breeding. Um, my name is uh, Erling Stambe and uh, I'm normally a professor at uh, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Um, and I will uh, start sharing uh, my presentation. Uh, now, uh, I am in this role here, I am actually the president of the study commission on animal genetics. Um, and uh, I would like to say a few words about um, this uh, commission. Uh, we are, as the name says, working with all questions regarded, uh, regarding animal genetics and genetic mechanisms underlying important traits in animals and how we can modify them um, through breeding. And uh, we work on all species. Uh, however, uh, we do tend to focus on uh, farmed animals. And uh, when we are working uh, in creating the annual conference of EAP, we often collaborate with um, other commissions to, to create uh, joint sessions. And uh, we also host the very active working group on uh, farm animal genetic resources. Uh, now, the coming EAP meeting in Davos in the end of August, beginning of September, um, I'd like to make some advertising for that as well. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, sessions that uh, the Genetics Commission are involved in, is involved in. Uh, we have almost 200 abstracts and um, there are six so-called titled sessions, meaning they had a title from the beginning, um, including then two joint sessions with the Commission on Health and Welfare on breeding for improved animal health, welfare and longevity. Uh, one with nutrition and physiology on uh, the interaction between host genetics and gastrointestinal tract microbiota genetics. Um, as those of you who've been uh, attending EAP, you also know that there are um, more free form sessions called challenge sessions. Uh, and one of them will be on a contribution of animal breeding to solving societal challenges. And another one will be on breeding for the future. Uh, technology finds application in new phenotypes, which is run by Faber TP. We also have some uh, projects that have their own sessions, so to speak. Um, one organized by the uh, working group uh, in collaboration with the working group, the Genres Bridge uh, project. Uh, and there are several projects included in the FANG uh, project session and the EU project GenTor is, uh, has its own session. And on top of that, we have four what we call bottom-up sessions uh, that are created from, from uh, abstracts that are submitted to uh, free communications. So there's going to be a lot of interesting sessions uh, in, in this meeting this year. So I hope to actually see you there in real life as well. So some housekeeping and organizational issues for today. Um, so this uh, meeting webinar will be recorded and it will then later be available on the, on the members uh, restricted site at EAP. Um, we will have about 20 minutes presentations per person and then about 10 minutes of questions and answers. And you can ask your questions in the chat box already during the, the talk. And I will take care of that after uh, the presentation is ended. Um, I think automatically your camera and microphone are muted. So uh, please keep it that way, uh, the whole seminar. And uh, afterwards you will 
uh, get a questionnaire uh, to follow up uh, how this uh, seminar worked. And then I'd like to remind you that the next webinar will be on the 15th of June uh, and uh, the exact title, etc., will be uh, announced later on the uh, EAP website, etc. So uh, moving for further for today's uh, program, um, we have three eminent speakers uh, and we will start uh, with uh, uh, the basics of uh, why what we are basing our animal breeding on, namely the domesticated animals and uh, Professor Per Jensen from Linköping University will uh, talk about domestication and behavior and focus on chickens. Uh, then researcher Esther Ellen from Wageningen University in Research uh, will continue on the topic of uh, uh, poultry and uh, look at the impact of breeding with a special focus on measuring behavior and improving activity and feather pecking. Then we'll have a short coffee break. And after that, uh, researcher uh, Lorian Cario uh, from INRE will uh, talk about uh, similar issues, but on uh, pigs, so breeding for pig behavior to improve health and welfare. And we'll have time after that also for uh, some general uh, comments and questions. So with that, um, I would just uh, like to uh, welcome Professor Per Jensen uh, from Linköping University to uh, present his uh, uh, talk. Go ahead, Pelle. Thank you very much, Erling, and thank you for organizing the seminar. <clears throat> thanks for inviting me here, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, so I will see that it works now. So the whole issue here is about domestication, genes and behavior. So I'm gonna tackle this topic from a rather fundamental perspective and share some of the research that we are doing uh, on the principles underlying domestication and, and different mechanisms whereby domestication has changed behavior. And I think this may probably be of some general and applied value as well. So why domestication? Well, it shouldn't come to any surprise uh, of any biologist. I think that domestication is just such an excellent study field for those of us who are interested in evolution. And uh, of course, that was realized already by Darwin uh, ages ago, uh, who basically used domestication as a proof of principle. But Today, we also have the tools at hand to actually understand the mechanisms that uh, underlie all the changes that animals go through during domestication. So um, my favorite study object in this respect is um, the chicken. And uh, chickens are, of course, uh, the, uh, well, there are numerous reasons for why chickens are such an excellent uh, study model. But one important aspect is, of course, that the um, wild ancestor, the red jungle fowl, is uh, still um, alive and uh, relatively thriving uh, in a few places around the world. One of those being our research lab, where we keep um, uh, a couple of breeding populations of red jungle fowl, and we can compare these uh, animals to the uh, uh, contemporary um, descendants of, of the red jungle fowl, that's various uh, domesticated chickens. And the one that we work most with is the uh, white leghorn layer as kind of a model of a domesticated species. So if we just start from the beginning, I mean, one of the striking aspects of domestication and behavior is that fundamental aspects of behavior has really not changed much at all. Domesticated chickens are still highly motivated to um, uh, perch at nighttime, to dust bathe during daytime, to form small social, small stable social groups, um, uh, to lay their eggs in seclusion. So all these kind of fundamental aspects have really passed through domestication relatively unaffected. 
Uh, but of course, there are differences. And, and this slide uh, just provides a, a few of the differences that we can see in behavior, things such as feeding behavior, explorative behavior, fearfulness and sociality, where kind of the structure or the, the let's, let's call it the threshold for different behaviors have, have changed uh, quite extensively in some respects, even though the fundamentals are the same. Some aspects of um, uh, the domestication phenotype, as it's referred to, are also very obvious in chickens, such as pigmentation changes, uh, increased reproduction, and also uh, modifications to the brain, uh, the source of all behavior. I'm not going to talk much about our work on brains and brain composition today, but I wish to speak a bit about the behavior, and I'm also going to touch a little bit about um, the reproduction and the domestication effects on, on reproduction. But of course, behavior is um, at the um, center court of, of this uh, seminar today. So let me just introduce you to two very simple behaviors <clears throat> in, in chickens that we that we measure routinely in my lab and in many other labs. One is the open field behavior and the other is the, the, the tonic immobility response. So both of those are composite reactions to stressful experiences, to, to fear eliciting uh, situations and, um, uh, and differ quite extensively between the, the red jungle fowl and the white leghorn layers. So to the left, what we see what we see here is um, a typical track uh, during a couple of minutes of open field behavior in a domesticated chicken. So open field is simply introducing the bird into this uh, completely unfurnished novel arena and then measuring the, 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 the tracks that they make over a couple of minutes. And this is typically what a, what a domesticated leghorn will do. This is typically what a red jungle fowl will do. So basically freezing behavior, responding with immobility as a fear reaction. So this is the well-known tonic immobility reaction, kind of the, 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 the final and ultimate anti-predator response when the bird, when facing a, 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 an acute physical threat, will go into this catatonic state of tonic immobility and staying in this, in this situation for um, uh, different amounts of time, depending on the state of fearfulness and stress. Now, this can, of course, be induced as on this picture manually. And we can measure things such as how long does it stay in this condition until it uh, rightens itself again. So <clears throat> just some, some, some data to... to to show the extent of the differences that we see. This is just an example, an old example from some of our experiments where we compared jungle fowl and white leghorns in the open field where we see that the leghorns uh, move uh, uh, considerably longer distances, which was shown in these tracks I showed you before, and in the tonic immobility test where the red jungle fowl stay immobile in this tonic state for um, a, a much longer period than a typical white leghorn. So working on differences such as this, we can start um, uh, looking for the genetic architecture underlying such differences. And in doing so, we can, we can get at which genes that, uh, that are affected during domestication and also which genetic mechanisms that actually cause uh, differences like the ones that I just illustrated. So I'm going to uh, walk you through a, a number of different uh, uh, approaches that we use to, um, to, to disentangle this genetic architecture. And I'll start with um, a genetic mapping technique that should be uh, well known to uh, many of you. And, and this is the intercross design in order to do genetic mapping, for example, quantitative trait locus mapping. So in our particular case, what we have done in our experiments is to um, cross uh, uh, white leghorn females with jungle fowl males, and then repeating this cross within each generation, uh, advancing up to, uh, well, several generation beyond. This is what we call the advanced intercross. Now this one stops at F8, but in fact, well, I think we are at about F20 today in, in, our, in our experiment. What we, of course, achieved during this is through um, recombinations in every generation, we, we, we get more and more of what we might call 
mosaic genomes where each chromosome is going to be composed of fragments of red jungle fowl ancestry and other fragments of white leghorn ancestry. And with every generation, we get smaller and smaller fragments, which also means that our mapping um, efforts can, can be um, uh, much more precise the more we move forwards in the generations. So we can now map different phenotypes. Um, uh, we, we, can, we, we can measure different phenotypes and we can map the, the, the phenotypic effects to particular chromosome regions. And this will help us to disentangle some of the genetic mechanisms underlying this domestication. So let me just show you again some of our uh, the first um, examples, the first uh, uh, um, results we got, and this has to do with the tonic immobility. So this is from chromosome one, where we uh, mapped the uh, duration and the number of attempts needed in order to induce this state. And when we look at the duration, we find a very nice QTL here um, in one end of chromosome one and another one. Uh, in the middle of the chromosome. When we look at the attempts, so how, how many times it takes to induce this, uh, we find, again, two QTLs. And this, in this particular case, there is one in the middle of the chromosome that seems to affect uh, different aspects of the tonic immobility reaction. Now, this is, of course, a, a, a crude mapping, and we haven't gone further with the uh, in, in this particular example to actually find map in order to find the genes that, the, that might underlie this difference. But this is the first uh, um, step towards actually finding the gene. The next step, um, uh, we have uh, uh, used the next step in order to, to approach um, the other behavior I illustrated, that's the open field behavior. So in addition to mapping the quantitative trait loci associated with the behavior such as, for example, total distance moved, time spent in the center, and so on. In addition to that, we also did an expression analysis. Using microarrays, we um, measured the expression of, of, of thousands of genes across the genome and mapped the expression QTLs. Then we look for overlaps between the QTLs explaining the phenotype and the expression QTLs, because that's where we are likely to find the causative genes. So if we look at a QTL map again, uh, this is on chromosome two, we find a peak here um, that is associated with the behavior phenotypes so or the time spent in the center of the arena in the open field test. And this coincides very nicely with the uh, expression QTL of this particular gene, the STK17A. So to verify that this gene is probably involved in affecting this behavior, we looked at the expression level of the gene and correlated that to the uh, behavioral phenotype. And we see a clear correlation here that the higher expression of this gene, um, the less we see of this particular behavior. So with some kind of confidence, we can suggest that this gene, which is the serine 309 kinase, is involved in, in this anxiety-related behavior in the chickens. And interestingly, when you look into the literature, we find that this gene is also involved in, in, in similar uh, phenotypes, both in humans and in mice. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so this is one way in which we can um, approach this, and um, uh, I'll show, move on to um, a slightly different approach to, to um, basically similar means. And this is by um, contemplating what's actually going on during domestication. So if you think about domestication as um, pretty much an acute selection event, it's, it, it consists of, of, of a kind of a bottleneck where a small fraction of the wild population is selected to become a domesticate. And if we look at uh, the, um, uh, the effect that this will have on different genes, we can, of course, visualize here and think that those genes that are particularly uh, important for the success of the domestication process, those are the ones that will be selected. And if we lose, uh, look at um, um, this on a kind of uh, cartoon-like chromosome illustration, 
the consequence of this is that in the domesticated populations we see today, we will find probably a much lower genetic variation on those loci that have been particularly interesting from a domestication perspective. So we can start looking for loci like that. And um, we did that um, uh, several years ago now by uh, resequencing a whole bunch of genomes from domesticated chickens uh, around the world uh, and also from red jungle fowl and then looking for, for genetic variation uh, at different positions in the genome. So what we see here is an upside down turn Manhattan map. So these are the chromosomes, different colors refer to different chromosomes um, in the chicken genome. And this scale, the lower we get down on the scale, the less genetic variation we have at this locus. So we can start looking at these places where we have least genetic variation. And there are, of course, many which we could start with. But um, one particularly interesting spot is uh, where we got the, the strongest signal. And that strongest signal actually uh, comes from this position where there is a gene very close by, which is this one, the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, TSHR. So we can start thinking about TSHR. What, it is, what, what is it? What is it doing? Why do we find this low genetic variation in this particular spot among uh, domesticated birds? First of all, the kind of the, the mutation that we find in the domesticated chickens is, is a um, quite um, drastic one. We have a, an amino acid some substitution, so that basically changes this protein quite radically. We know from archaeological uh, research or gene uh, archaeological genetics that this was present several thousand years ago, so it has been uh, around in this chicken population for quite some time now. We also know from comparative studies that this is a, um, a, a, a gene or rather a receptor that is really important for the photoresponse. And this may have to do with, with onset of reproduction in chickens. So the fact that it has so low genetic variation and it has these really interesting biological features makes us think that this could be a true domestication gene. So how do we proceed from that? Well, we went back to our um, uh, intercross where we had all these fragmented chromosomes uh, with different parts from jungle fowl, different parts from leghorns, and we genotyped these intercross birds for their genotype on the, uh, on the TSHR gene. And based on that, we could, we can, or we could select um, parental birds, parents for a cross which were uh, heterozygous for this TSHR gene. So they were carrying one wild allele and one domestic allele at this particular locus. And by crossing them, what we do get is, of course, 50% heterozygotes again, and but 25% of the birds will be either um, pure for the domesticated variant or pure for the, um, for the wild variant. And the main point here is that if we select the number of birds, if, if we breed a number of birds with this, with this genotype, we will get a, 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 a very nice study material where these birds are, we know the genotype on this particular uh, gene, but the rest of the genome is kind of random mixes of domesticated and wild variants. So we can look at the effect of this domesticated variant against the background noise of random uh, combinations of wild and domestic um, alleles. So what do we find here? Well, pretty much as expected actually, but always nice to confirm things, is that um, this uh, seems to affect the egg production. So chickens that do are homozygous for the domestic variants start uh, breeding a, a bit earlier, or rather they, 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 their egg production increases uh, quicker than uh, in the wild uh, origin on, under uh, similar environmental conditions. But more interesting, I think, is the fact that this TSHR gene does not only affect reproduction. It actually turns out to have a, a number of different effects on on animal behavior as well. So for example, we looked at the fear of humans in a, uh, in a standardized fear of human test that we, are, that we are using in the lab. And it turns out that in, in males, we get um, a very nice um, 
effect of this where males are less fear of uh, fearful of humans when they have the domesticated variants we also looked at social dominance and aggression uh, against other birds and again we find that in this time in females that uh, carrying the domesticated alleles in the double variant actually decreases the aggression so these are nice features of domestication um, which we uh, we know already now uh, today, of course, when we compare the jungle fowl and the white leghorns, that these differences are prevalent. And here we can see that a lot, uh, at least parts of this difference is probably due to this particular gene and, and the variant that has been selected. So this is a mutation that has somehow uh, originated during domestication of chickens and that uh, people have selected for during the process. But I'll also like to show you another example, which is we, uh, I personally think is really, really cool. So if we go back to the same Manhattan plot, uh, as I showed you before, there is another gene here that has a very strong signal. And this is the BCO2 or BCDO2, depending on what you want to say. This is um, uh, a gene called beta carotene oxygenase or deoxygenase 2. Um, this gene is the one that uh, is responsible for the fact that uh, many or most of domesticated chickens actually have yellow legs, in spite of the fact that uh, jungle fowl have gray legs. What do we know about uh, the, the enzyme, the, this uh, deoxygenase? Well, it's very important in metabolization of carotenoids, and I'll come back to that in a few seconds. Now, what is really cool about this is that when we when we did this mapping, it turns out that this is probably not an, uh, a mutation that has originated during the domestication process of chickens. So we have quite clear evidence that this variant, this allele, is introgressed from a, from another species, the closely related species, the gray jungle fowl that is pictured down to the right here. And we were um, hypothesizing that maybe this is a gene that will buffer uh, the ability to, to, to use carotenoid poor diets. Uh, and I'll show you the evidence we got for that. But just a, uh, a quick glance on how we attacked this. Again, we went back to our uh, advanced intercross. But this time we chose birds that were homozygous for the wild uh, allele of this BCO2. And we cross these birds with pure white leghorns that carry, of course, the domesticated variants. Uh, so this will create um, a heterozygous bird, uh, which we again can cross back to uh, the white leghorns. And by doing this repeatedly for five generations, what we in the end achieve are birds that are heterozygous for the BCO2 uh, allele, but uh, in the rest of the, uh, their um, genome, they are pure white leghorns. So um, what we can do then is to uh, uh, cross again these two. And here we get um, pure white leghorns. We get heterozygous for the uh, BCO2 gene against a background of white leghorns. And we get homozygous BCO2 against a background of pure white leghorns. So here is a bit more precision in actually estimating the effect of this particular gene. So basically what we have done by this is to integrate the, uh, the, the wild allele back into a modern white leghorn layer. And uh, as we expected, this of course affects the color of, of their legs and of their beaks. So here is, um, um, uh, in this experiment, we measured the, the yellowness of legs and beak over age in females and males. And what we can see here is that the, the yellowness actually increases up to the point when egg laying starts. And then there is a rapid decrease in yellowness. Uh, we see a similar pattern in males, but much, much less dramatic decrease. OK, so what's going on here? Well, first of all, egg carotenoids they are, uh, they are the ones that give the yellow color to the egg yolk, and they are the ones that also improve for food quality for humans and also survival of chicks. The problem is that the, the carotenoids are limited by the food, and the agricultural diets that our domesticated birds were exposed to are really poor in, in carotenoids. So 
we measured the uh, yellowness of eggs as well um, over the time that they were laid. And it turns out that birds that were carrying this um, domesticated variant of the BCO2, the introgressed variant, their eggs were not only more yellow, but we could also measure different carotenoids and show that they are higher in carotenoid content. So this is a really nice um, example of how hybridization can increase the fitness of a domesticated uh, animal. So what we showed so far is uh, two different ways in which domestication can evolve favorable traits. So the first obvious thing, which I suspect that many people are thinking about, is to basically breed on the novel mutations that uh, occur randomly. But the other uh, possibility is hybridization that might actually be much more important than believed when it comes to domestication of, of animals. Um, and the last um, uh, example I just want to briefly mention is the possibility that parts of the domestication process is mediated not directly by genetic mutations and introgression of new alleles, but actually of epigenetic modifications. We have looked specifically at one epigenetic modification, and that's DNA methylation. Uh, so methylation of the cytosines in, in CPG positions. Now, um, what we find is a, a really interesting difference when we compare between the red jungle fowl, the ancestral red jungle fowl, and the modern white leghorn layers. In this particular case, we look at gene expression in brain, uh, more precisely in midbrain, which is the part containing hypothalamus and, and, and thalamus. So the heat map that, that is depicted here shows genes. So there's one gene on each of the, the rows here, and the columns are um, uh, pools of individuals of different uh, sexes here. So red signifies a hypermethylated gene, and blue signifies a hypomethylated gene. And as you can see here, there is a very nice a very nice uh, profile that signifies whether or not you are a red jungle fowl or a white leghorn. And this is largely inherited by the offspring. So the offspring's methylation pattern in the brain is very similar to that of the parents. So which genes is it that are affected by this? We have run um, a gene ontology on this, and it turns out that uh, these genes are enriched for processes such as stress responses, memory consolidation, neural differentiation and reproduction. So pretty much the types of processes that we connect with domestication. Um, so indeed, it seems that uh, epigenetic differences are also really important in creating uh, these rapid changes that occur during domestication. And as a very last uh, little remark, I would just want you to, to remind you that epigenetics is also a very dynamic process that changes throughout the lifetime of an individual. And in fact, we can, we can use the epigenetic profile to reflect the background life of, um, of, of the chicken. So this is from an experiment where we compared um, erythrocytes, so blood, uh, blood cells, red blood cells, um, DNA methylation between birds that were either growing up in an aviary uh, with free, in free range or in cages, which is believed to be a, a more stressful life to a chicken. And what we can see here is that when we cluster the differentially methylated gene, we get a clear signature of an aviary background that is different from a signature from the cage background. So. We think that uh, this kind of, of epigenetic analysis may not only help us understand domestication, but may actually also be a way of, of, of uh, uh, tracking the welfare history of, of birds. So to conclude this talk, what I would like to say is uh, three things. Um, yes, domestication evolved through novel mutations, but it's also important to remember that these mutations sometimes have pleiotropic effects. So they may be selected because they affect reproduction, for example, but at the same time, they can very well affect things such as uh, behavior, aggression, and, and other types of behavior. Species hybridization, a bit uh, unexpected, 
seems also to have contributed to chicken domestication and may well be a very important process at large. And don't forget the epigenetic factors, which uh, could in fact be important in driving domestication. And so with that, and with this uh, slightly old picture of my group that uh, depicts uh, at least most of the people who have contributed uh, the data that I'm showing you here, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I have not received any questions in the chat, um, but um, I can ask some questions myself. Um, I was in, in the beginning, you were showing these four trait groups. Um, and um, I, I can understand that some of them are more important than others. What do you think, uh, what, what are more most important for the uh, domestication success, so to speak? Um, well, uh, my, my favorite pet hypothesis is that it's tameness. And uh, we really have a lot of data um, uh, that supports the view that uh, the initial selection for tameability in chickens and probably other species as well has been totally instrumental in generating many of the other phenotypic differences that we see. So fear of humans is, of course, an, an, an ontogenetic effect, but um, the ability to be tamed uh, is a genetic factor. And uh, uh, we have selected red jungle fowl for tameness only over many generations. This is another experiment I didn't have time to go into. And it clearly shows that a lot of the traits that we associate with domestication tend to develop as correlated uh, pleiotropic traits. So if I would have to pick one, it would be tameness. Okay. Tame yeah. Tameability. Yeah. Uh when you talked about this TSHR mutation, you, you also mentioned that it's been found like 3000 years ago or something. Mm. Um, but the, the chicken were domesticated 3000 year for 2000 year before that or something, yes. I think. Yeah. So, um, so is, is this, do you think it's just a matter of we don't have information further back or that it occurred later than the first domestication? I events? think it's I think I think it's a combination of that. First of all, I, I really don't think it occurred um, uh, early during domestication. We know that egg production in chickens was a relatively late uh, idea uh, to, to have chickens. The chickens were domesticated probably for other purposes than increased egg production. Uh, but also, of course, this is based on archeological uh, DNA and uh, we don't have that much evidence. I think two, three, two, three thousand years back is quite impressive in its own right. So, um, uh, but technology is developing fast and soon we can probably sequence genomes from, from much older specimens than that. Yeah. I will take one question. I have one question from the audience, Christine Bays. Uh, um, thank you for your presentation. Would you expect similar results in the domesticated turkey? Um, which uh, has followed similar, but perhaps not as intense selection. Um, yes, I, I, I assume we would. We, I would expect uh, very similar things there because, um, uh, but 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 turkeys are, of course, they have a different social life, so it would be different uh, different aspects of behavior that would would change. But it would be really interesting to do something similar in turkeys. People have looked at quail which are sometimes considered miniature chickens. They are not, they are very, very different in their behavior and so on, but we still see very similar, uh, similar responses to selection and domestication. So yes, I, I, I would assume to, that the turkeys would be quite similar. Yeah. Um, so one, one pet question when it comes to domestication is whether the, the, we domesticated the animal or the animal domesticated us. I guess people who have cats would vote for the latter, but uh, what do you think is this a combination? Uh, yeah, I think it's a cool question. I, I, I always used to, to um, argue that oh, it, it, it was, it was a, a, mutual, a, a mutual procedure basically. But uh, I, with accumulating research over the last 10 years or so, it seems more and more like every species has their own history. Uh, 
Uh, so, um, I mean, dog domestication is obviously a case where wolves chose humans. Uh, when it comes to chickens, I would rather vote for, for the guess that uh, humans chose chickens. And one reason for that is that red jungle fowl are extremely fearful of humans. In the wild, they're almost impossible to, to, to uh, get hold of and so on. So I can't really see how that could have been domesticated unless people have collected eggs, incubated the eggs and actually used the, uh, the chicken's unique imprinting capacity to, to, to domesticate them. So I would think that in case of chickens, we chose them. Okay, thank you very much, Per. Um, so uh, it's time to move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, Esther Ellen from Wageningen University and Research. Uh, so Esther will talk about the impact of breeding on poultry behavior. And you could please start sharing your screen. <clears throat> Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, Esther, you are still muted. Yes, sorry, very good. Okay, so uh, once more, thank you Erling for this uh, introduction and um, thank you for inviting me for this uh, nice seminar. Uh, my name is Esther Ellen and I'm a researcher at Animal Breeding and Genomics of Wageningen University and Research. Um, I'm not a, a specialist in, in poultry behavior, but I'm really interested in, in using new technologies to, to study complex traits. And, and behavior is one of those uh, complex traits. So the, the content of this presentation, first I would like to spend a few slides on, on poultry behavior. Um, then I would like to um, um, uh, to uh, discuss how we can measure uh, these kind of behaviors. And then I would like to focus on, on two kind of uh, traits. Uh, one is uh, on, on feather pecking and how we can apply breeding to reduce feather pecking. And, and the second one is focusing on uh, activity of broilers. But before starting this presentation, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Malou van der Sluis and, and Peter Bijma. Um, their work will be presented also in, the, in this presentation. Uh, and besides that, I would like to acknowledge uh, Breed for Food, which is a consortium of the breed, uh, four breeding companies, Dutch breeding companies, uh, which includes uh, COP and Hendrik Genetics. Uh, and, that, and I would like to acknowledge uh, STW, which is a Dutch funding organization. So in the previous presentation, um, we already saw that there are different kinds of behaviors in, in poultry. Uh, for instance, we can think of uh, explorative behavior, feeding behavior, uh, sociality, uh, but also fearfulness uh, is recognized as a behavior. And these behaviors can be have both have positive or negative consequences on the uh, welfare of the individuals. Um, if we look at, for instance, uh, feather pecking or, or smothering, uh, these behaviors can have a large impact on, on the well-being of, of the animals. And uh, we would like to use breeding to improve or to reduce, for instance, the consequences of feather pecking. So to reduce feather pecking in, in laying ends. But when you think of uh, measuring those behaviors, then one of the questions is how can we measure those behaviors in poultry? And then it's important to recognize uh, how poultry is kept in commercial situations. So this is a nice picture of uh, an, 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 an poultry housing systems. And what you can see, and which is quite common in most of the poultry systems is that poultry, uh, both laying hens and, and broilers are kept in large groups. And what you can also see in this picture that they are more or less look alike the same. 
So it's quite difficult to identify and recognize an individual birth in this group of birth. And it's also very difficult to recognize behaviors in those, um, in those groups of birds. Monitoring of behavior is even more complex, monitoring during time. And it's also very time consuming to uh, measure behaviors in these kind of uh, groups because you need a person that is writing down the different kind of behaviors. And you can imagine that it will not be that accurate because uh, sometimes uh, the person will miss some kind of behaviors. And it's very difficult to say, okay, which animal will perform what kind of behavior. But since a couple of years, uh, there's a uh, huge uh, increase in, in new technologies. And we could use those new technologies to um, study, for instance, uh, behavior and measure behavior. So at Wageningen University of Research, we have several projects uh, which use new technologies to, uh, to measure behavior. And one of the projects is the Inno Broiler Image proje Project, which is uh, a project uh, from Ingrid de Jong. And there they use uh, camera techniques, uh, techniques to, to measure behavior, but also uh, welfare related. Besides these uh, camera techniques, uh, we could also use uh, sensor technologies to, to measure behavior or to uh, measure traits that could be an indicator of behavior. And, and one of the projects that is uh, um, using these sensor technologies is the PET project of uh, Malou van der Sluis, which is uh, part of Breed for Food. And here in this project, he is using these sensor technologies to uh, measure activity. And later on in this presentation, I will give some more background of this project and uh, what she's doing in, the, in that project. So, but besides uh, those new technologies, there are also other possibilities that could be used um, to uh, measure behavior. Uh, and that are uh, the use of, uh, uh, we call it a proxy traits. So there are traits that can tell something about the behavior of animals. And, and one of those examples is uh, activity in the project of Malou van der Sluis. You could also think of uh, survival time or plumage condition as an um, indicator of feather pecking, uh, or what is already mentioned in, in the previous presentation, um, use tonic immobility as an indicator of uh, uh, fearfulness. So now I would like to focus a bit more on one of the, the behaviors in, in poultry, uh, which uh, is a, a quite important one uh, and has quite some impact on, on the well-being of the birds, which is uh, feather pecking. And this was part of my uh, PhD, uh, but also part of my postdoc period. Feather pecking is a, a multifactorial problem, so it depends on uh, many factors. Uh, and in this picture, I, I show uh, a, a few of them. Uh, one of the factors that has a, a large impact on feather pecking is uh, light intensity, uh, but also the rearing system has quite some impact on the, the development of feather pecking. Uh, the nutrition of the birds, uh, but also the, the group size and, and the group density. Uh, the genotype of the individual, uh, but we also see a large effect on the, of the group numbers uh, on feather pecking. So feather pecking is a is socially affected trait. Uh, and in the next few slides, I would like to give a bit of a background how this is working. Um, so uh, a socially affected trait means that the, the trait or the phenotype of an individual not only depends on its own phenotype. So for instance, if this uh, animal, this blue animal is, is pecked, not only depends on its own phenotype, which is also called the direct genetic, genetic effect, but it also depends on the phenotype and the genotype of its group members. This is called the 
the social genetic effect or the indirect genetic effect. In animal breeding, we are, we are interested in estimating the breeding value of an animal. And if we are looking at socially affected traits, then the, the breeding value of an, of an individual uh, not only um, consists of its direct breeding value, but it also consists of the social breeding value. So the impact an individual has also on its group members. And so this combination of the direct breeding value and the social breeding value is also called the total breeding value. So if you would like to improve feather pecking, then normally what we do is we uh, use behavioral observations. But I already mentioned in the beginning of my presentation that uh, collecting behavioral observations is really time consuming. And, and it's very difficult uh, what kind of uh, behavioral observations we should collect. Um, and then we also would like to collect uh, observations on both the victim and the pecker. And this is very difficult to apply in animal, apply in animal breeding because we need quite a large number of, of animals. And then if we both need information on the victim and the pecker, it makes, this makes it quite difficult to apply in, in animal breeding. But there is a, a solution which comes from a statistical method. And using the statistical methods, we can use a direct indirect effects model, uh, which uh, allows us to identify the victim and pecker. So in this indirect genetic effects model, we, we take into account both the victim and the pecker. And when we use this direct indirect effects model, then um, uh, we estimated the heritability for, um, for both survival time and plumage condition. And um, the heritability for the, for the victim effect range between four and 10%. But then we also take into account the, the, the indirect genetic effects, so the effect of the group members, then the, the measurement of heritability ranges between 10 and 54%, uh, percent, which is quite an, uh, an improvement. And we also noticed that uh, especially the, the, the pecker effect, so the effect of the group members, had a large impact on the total genetic variation, which varied between 33 and 94%, percent, meaning that, those, that, that taking into account the group uh, effect or the group member effect is very important if we would like to um, uh, improve or to reduce uh, feather pecking in, in laying hands. So based on this information, we, uh, we did a selection experiment where we uh, um, used a selection method where we uh, took into account both the victim effect and, and the pecker effect. And we call this selection method uh, selection based on relatives. Uh, the selection candidates were housed individually and were selected based on the performance of SIPs kept in family groups. And, and using this selection method, we, uh, uh, we found quite an, an impact on, on the survival of the birds. And, and in this figure, you can see that we selected for six generations. Um, and in the, in the different colors, you see that we kept them at, in different locations um, that was due to circumstances. And what you can see is that there's quite an impact of the location on the um, survival. But what you can also see is that, uh, especially in the, in the final or in the last three generations, that we could uh, improve survival time uh, and, 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 and therefore also could reduce uh, feather packing. So, you, so uh, based on this um, selection experiment, but also based on, on previous work on the, the statistical methods, uh, we showed that uh, when we include um, the effect of group members, then we can improve survival time and can reduce uh, better packing in laying hands. So currently a, a new project started, which is called the Imagine Project uh, of Peter Weimar, 
And in this project, they also focus on feather packing and smothering, but then in larger groups. And they use new technologies to measure uh, feather packing and smothering in laying hands. So now I would like to continue with the final part of my presentation, which will focus on the uh, activity of broilers, uh, which is part of the PhD project of uh, Malou van der Slant. Activity is a uh, quite interesting trait, uh, and it can be linked to uh, the health, welfare, and performance of animals. Uh, for instance, if an animal is ill, then it will be less active, and uh, will be less active. Uh, but we can also see that, uh, for instance, activity as a as a relation with uh, the leg health. And in the PhD project of Malou van der Slice, we are interested in um, measuring activity. Uh, but I already mentioned that uh, measuring uh, these kind of uh, um, traits is, is, is quite a, a challenge. So uh, um, what we uh, did in our PhD project is that we implemented an automatic, automatic system to monitor individual animals and to measure activity. So in our PhD project, um, um, she used uh, two different sensor approaches. Um, one was focusing on the ultra wideband tracking. Um, there you have a, a tag on the back of, an, of a bird, and, and this tag can be placed when they are two weeks old. Um, and uh, using this tag, you can um, measure the activity of a bird, or you can uh, estimate the, the distance moved. And she also used uh, radio frequency identification. Um, this is a very tiny tag. Uh, which is placed on, on the leg of the bird, uh, and you can use this tag from uh, one day old uh, onwards. So in the next slide, I would like to focus on, on this RFRD system, which we apply to uh, broilers. So in this figure, you can see uh, the RFRD system. So um, there is a, a pen, with um, several, with a grid of antennas. And, and using um, these antennas, uh, we can see if an animal is present or absent on a certain antenna. And based on this information, we can uh, calculate the, the, the movement of an animal and we can calculate the uh, activity of an animal. So here are some more pictures of, of the system. Uh, on, the, on the left, you can see the uh, antennas in, in green, uh, which are on the, on the bottom of a floor. And in the, in the middle picture, you can see the pen with the birds. Uh, some of the birds were, were marked uh, because we used video to validate the system. Uh, and in the bottom, you can see the output of the RFID system. So when we compare the RFID system with video, then we had a quite good rank correlation of 0.82. So this uh, RFID system was quite accurate in, in measuring the, um, the distance moved of an animal. And, and therefore, we think it's an interesting um, technology to use uh, to measure activity in, in, um, in birds. So uh, based on that information, we decided to, uh, to do an, an, a next experiment where we were interested in estimating genetic parameters for activity and broilers. Um, so we used um, almost 400 uh, purebred male broilers. Um, the data was collected in, in five rounds. Uh, and for each round, um, every second, the location of a bird was uh, registered from hatching until uh, slaughtering. The traits that we measured were uh, the weekly body weight. Uh, based on that, we could calculate the growth rate. Uh, we uh, collected data on locomotion. And, and based on the um, output of the RFD system, we could um, uh, calculate the activity, uh, which was the average 
distance moved per hour per day. So here you can see uh, the increase in body weight over time. Uh, and you can see um, the uh, level of activity uh, for the different rounds. And, and you can see that activity is decreasing over time, which is also quite common and, and which is also shown in, in previous studies. Uh, so we estimated uh, the heritability, uh, both for uh, body weight and, and activity. And for body weight, it was approximately uh, 30%. And for activity, it was approximately 35%, which shows quite some potential to improve activity um, and to um, select for um, an activity trait. However, uh, we, we didn't look at trade-offs yet, yet and, and that is quite important. So if we would like to include activity in, in a breeding program, we first need to know if there is a trade-off between uh, before performance, so between uh, body weight, uh, but also between welfare and health-related traits. So we will work on that in, in the near future. So with that, I would like to summarize this presentation. Um, so um, behavior is a, is a difficult to, to measure trait. Um, it's a complex trait. Um, uh, we could use uh, uh, traits that are an indication of, of behavior, like um, activity or, or survival time. Uh, but I also think that the, the new technologies really will help us to, to measure behavior. Um, in previous work, we showed that we are able to uh, use breeding to improve um, traits, so to reduce uh, feather pecking and to improve survival time. And, and it's very important to take into account the victim and the, the, the actor or the pecker, the group uh, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, I have one question in the chat. Um, Alpertuna Kavlak is asking, um, in the variance of the TBV, so the total breeding value, uh, why is the covariance between the direct and the indirect, uh, why, why is that missing? Is, yeah, that's is that something? No, that's for simplicity in this presentation. Uh, but uh, normally, yeah, so if you have the total breeding value, then you have the uh, direct genetic variance and the indirect genetic variance and, and the covariance, which is quite important uh, between the direct and indirect genetic yeah. yes. So this, um, this social interaction model, um, it, it's in a way quite similar to the direct maternal genetic model that has been used for, for a long time. Uh, but, but of course there we only have one indirect genetic effect, the mother, and the mother is usually the biological genetic mother as well. Um, but here, so what, what is the best way to construct the groups uh, for these type of, of models. Yeah, so if you would like to uh, estimate direct and indirect genetic effects, then uh, we would then it would be good to have random groups or at least two families in one groups. Because if you have a, a family, then you're not able to disentangle uh, direct and indirect genetic effects. But if you would like to select for um, socially effective traits, uh, then you would like to collect information on, on family groups uh, because then uh, you have the, the total breeding value, which uh, includes the direct and indirect genetic effects. So it really depends on, on your question, uh, what kind of group structure you would want. Okay, but but in order to do the actual selection, then then you would at least have uh, a family group or full SIB uh, yes. group. Yeah. Yes, yeah, full yeah. half SIBs, yes, yes. Preferably full SIBs, yes. Yeah. Um, there is one question from Joanna Pulu Pulu. Uh, thank you for the info informative presentation, of course. Uh, how easy or difficult was it to keep the sensors on the chicken? Yes, that's still a, a challenge. And, and, and the, 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 the problem is that in, in broilers that the legs are increasing quite 
uh, substantial. So we had to change them uh, several times uh, to make mm. uh, We are still working on that one. Yes. Uh, there is also one in the actual chat. Um, from uh, Simon Turner, uh, is it possible to scale up the RFID approach to generate activity phenotypes on large number of selection candidates? It looks quite expensive to implement uh, from your photos. Yes, no, that's true. It's it's uh, in, in our setup, so it's a research setup, so it's a, a quite expensive system. Uh, but yeah, we were really interested in, in accurate measurements. Um, so the, the number of animals, so you can use as many tags as, as, as possible, uh, but if you would like to follow larger groups, then, then I would use uh, maybe a, a grid with less antennas or, or maybe place it on a certain uh, position in the barn where you know that they uh, visit often uh, that position, uh, so then you would do it differently, but you can scale up, um, yes. Yeah, okay. That, that was another question as well. How big was the group in which the activity was measured? And Yeah, uh, so in, in, for the heritability estimates, we used a, a group of 80 birds, which is, of course, not the practical situation, uh, but uh, you, you could scale up, um, uh, yeah, if you have a larger pen uh, size, of course. Yeah. Um, so the, the activity, one question from Christina Pfeiffer, um, to which welfare trait do you think activity is related? Um, she thinks that maybe uh, activity is affecting performance traits. And what's your op opinion? Yeah, so we think that, that you could relate activity to several traits. So um, uh, health related traits, uh, which also have an impact of course on, on welfare. Uh, but in, in literature, you can also see that there is a relation between activity and and, um, and, and leg health, for instance, uh, which is also a bell brain. Okay. Yeah. Yes. But I think it's also important to, to investigate the relation with performance because, uh, yeah, you would like to have a, a kind of an, an optimum in, in your breeding program. And I would also imagine, I mean, in some animals, act too high activity could sort of uh, reduce weight gain because they're actually wasting energy on on running around instead of <laughs> growing to put it by yeah, that, yeah so we are still uh, looking into that uh, what the relationship is um, yes um let me see here i have um Okay, uh, Joanne, sorry, uh, not Joanna, uh, Christine uh, Bayes, also a follow-up. Uh, the range of, of heritability was quite high. Uh, uh, so what was the range of the covariance, if it's so important, or maybe the correlation is, is easier to, yes. to talk about? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know by, by, uh, by in, I don't know the, the actual numbers. Um, so for survival, um, the, the, the covariance um, for one line, it was negative. And for the other one, it was positive, but the, 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 it was uh, not significant different from, uh, from zero. So that's, uh, um, and for too much condition, uh, I also thought that there were some differences. So it really depended on the line um, if, if, uh, if the, uh, the, the, the covariance or the correlation was uh, was negative or positive, but I, I have to check. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and Katja Nilsson also asks, is, is there a risk that activity is related to fear, so more flighty animals? So the one would risk selecting for more fearful animals when you select for more active animals? Yes, good question. And um, I don't think I can answer that question because we, we haven't looked at it, but I think it's important to uh, take that in consideration. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, no, do you mention, I mean, it's it's always a risk with proxy traits that you, that it might be, well, it's selected to what you're interested in, but it could also be select, uh, related to something else. Uh, so, uh, so you 
yes. as you mentioned, you need to check up on the on the correlations with other traits. Yes. Uh, well, uh, time is uh, saying that we should uh, have a short break. So thank you very much. There are some more questions for you in the in the chat and in the Q and A box. So if you please can answer them uh, in text, that would be nice. Yes. Um, and now we will have um, a short uh, coffee break or whatever you want to drink, and we will be be back at uh, twenty past two. Okay, welcome back after the very short break. Um, and now I would like to welcome Lauriane Canario uh, to present her presentation on breeding for pig behavior to improve their health and welfare. Welfare, please, uh, Lauriane, if you can uh, share your screen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and first I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to present at this webinar. I will describe some of the reasons why uh, counting for the behavior of pigs in selective breeding could promote jointly um, their performance, health and welfare. I will make a focus on two categories of animals for which improving health and welfare has become paramount. The sow during the lactation period and the young pigs um, while they are raised with their group mates. Until the end of the 20th century, pig selection aimed at improving lean growth and prolificacy, and since then also uh, targeted some traits related to robustness. Most of these changes observed on the animals refer to the traits under selection, production, and fitness. And from the behavioral point of view, due to trade-offs between production and energy expenditure, a decrease of activity level, similar to that assessed in other species, was observed. Modern pigs also tend to be more aggressive than in the past, but still there is no clear evidence of it. It is likely that selection promoted the choice of sows with good maternal abilities, capable of a more efficient nursing activity, which is desirable because selection for lean growth on finishers led indirectly to enhanced growth potential of the piglets. So the piglets are more eager to suckle than in the past. But piglet production remains unsatisfactory regarding the number of piglets wind relative to the number of piglets born. Indeed, selective breeding faces natural limitations as regard to litter size. Piglets are less physiologically mature than in the past. Early mortality due to crushing by the sow and starvation slightly increased. And animals tend to be more reactive, more sensitive to stress. Selection is only possible, but in many populations, it leads to little progress due to the low irritability of the trait and because measuring genetic potential is hampered by the cross-fostering procedures. The dam and its progeny interact to define piglet survival. In breeding schemes, to account for the influence of both sow and piglet genes on the performance, two genetic effects uh, should be included in the model, like we previously said. This requires to use traits recorded at the individual piglet scale. In addition, most conventional systems use crates. This housing does not allow the sow to move and interact normally with its piglets. To adjust to the legislation and citizens' expectation, a transition towards looser housing system is needed. Breeding for the number of wind piglets may be more efficient with sows free of movements in loose individual pens. And in that context, accounting for behavior in breeding goals may be a manner to achieve a better performance. Given that behaviors are influenced by both genetic and environmental factors, eventually different breeding goals will be needed for different environments. Are modern sows more maternal in their behavior? Could sow else be related to variation in piglet survival? The assumption we formulate is that both sow behavior and sow else statue may contribute to piglet mortality. We need a strategy to improve both components. And I consider sow postural activity as a possible global lever to reduce piglet losses if it can alleviate farrowing difficulties, 
lactation problems, leg problems on the south, and the, um, difficulties to cope with the environment, all at once. In particular, physical difficulties impact sows lying down behavior and their responsiveness to piglets. Sows that could be described as not attentive may in reality have reduced control and therefore uh, they are more prone to flop down during the lying down movement. Roughly on this scheme is the average pattern of lactating sow activity. Uh, on the left side, at arrival in the farrowing unit, the sow has to cope with the new environment. She may be restless and then, then she calms down. The day before farrowing, she is highly active, preparing its nest, and she, next she calms down and farrows, being lying down on one side for most of the time. Gradually after, she resumes her activity and changes posture to establish contact with its progeny. 24 hours post farrowing, she starts cyclic nursing approximately every hour, alternating between phases of activity and inactivity. And from the literature, we know that um, different uh, of this measurement of activity at different uh, time points relate to the different causes of piglet mortality, like illustrated on the graph. So the activity. It's the time spent by the sow active. But postures like standing, sitting, lying ventrally, lying laterally are a fine manner to analyze it. It is interesting to characterize a population as a whole using postural activity and to establish, in the case of longitudinal records, the individual trajectories of the animals. With intrapopulation comparison makes it possible to distinguish between the individuals that have a normal activity pattern from those that have a deviant activity pattern. The challenge is then to define which time window is optimal to record behavior and related to health problems in cells and piglet mortality. The behavior of interest must be validated. Once the measure has been chosen, on several, um, the, the implementation of a large scale um, records on several fronts, working with the same genetics uh, and studied across different environmental conditions will allow the estimation of its genetic component. It is important to assess the genetic relationship with the other traits included in the selection objective to finalize the choice of a behavioral measurement as a selection criteria. The Farm Animal Welfare Council mentioned long ago that selection for behavior should be considered in pig breeding programs, but still few attempts have been met to target behavior with genetic selection. Regarding the choice of breeders, the farmers select their animals on behavior already in routine, like removing the sounds that show to be aggressive toward piglets. But for long, we have taken note of the elusive nature of this behavior because removing undesired sounds does not solve the problem. This is evidence that to address this issue, the solution may be to act on its genetic basis. Then we can refer to a different breeding strategy, either breeding for the behavior itself or solution to indirectly improving uh, behavior by breeding for performance that account for the identity of uh, individuals of the group mates and eventually early the behavior of all these animals. But so the solution to still focus on the performance. The use uh, of an advanced model like direct maternal model or the so-called social model that explained in the previous talk puts very high demands on data structure and computer capacity. And so it's far difficult to use in routine genetic evaluation for the moment. To enlarge the breeding goal, uh, a behavioral trait so is defined as criteria of selection. And it can refer to notation by the farmer, data from automatic devices. What is needed is standardization of the measure to grab accurately the genetic variance underlying the traits uh, in underlying the trait. And um, in the end, the important information is summarized into a selection index 
and an equation attributing weights to the different criteria to achieve a certain genetic uh, gain. Independent of favorable association between selected traits facilitates the progress on each of them. And accounting for behavior in breeding scheme as a proxy for animal health will promote a more efficient and more sustainable production, allowing animals to stay longer on farm and thus to need to be more profitable. So previously analyzed the consequences of selection. Genetic trends in French large white cells were studied 20 years ago. By using frozen semen, two types of cells were compared, an ancient type in blue and a more modern one in red. Two populations were studied in the same environment and contemporarily for several generations. The trends in prolificacy were uh, became much greater in the period after this study. So changes in the behavior may have been much important after this study. In this yellow time period that we studied, weak but significant genetic trends in maternal behavior were found. The modern cells were lying for a longer period after the onset of farrowing, which was associated with greater farrowing difficulties. We had a low activity at farrowing is generally uh, interpreted as positive for the piglets, limiting the fact that they would be crushed. But in that population, we, sh we showed that it was also related to the poor welfare of the modern cells. Postural activity can summarize with uh, all postures in a short pie. Then the time budget is calculated over a defined period of relative percent of time spent in different postures. So the pie chart condenses the information. And what we observed in the early lactation period was also that the modern cells tend to spend more time lying ventrally, so hiding the other. Um, standing, they were more responsive to their piglets and more efficient in their nursing activity. And all of this information was uh, obtained from uh, fine analysis uh, uh, of video records. Also aware of differences between breeds, uh, so for this, a population of Meishan, it's a Chinese breed with exceptional reproductive ability uh, that we compare to the large white breed. And the Meishan breed shows an extremely low piglet mortality. It falls into the category of stoic animals. It, it's moving very slowly. And besides this, it is a highly explorative animal, spending much time sniffing around. So the question was, does the breed the mission breed show the same range of maternal behavior as the large rights, and could this be related to the piglet survival? So we compared the mission and the large right cells uh, in individual pens at farrowing, and we were interested in the reaction of the cell. Sorry. Um, uh, from uh, to the separation from its litter while the piglets are weighted in another location, and we analyzed and in different posture before, during, and after um, the removal of the litter, the, the, after the, the, the litter was back. So, so all of this with video, and we highlighted with differences. The large rights spent more time standing during uh, the separation. They were more reactive. And if we put on the time spent uh, lying laterally on the right side, it indicates that the reactivity was lower uh, at day seven than at day one. So there is a time effect in the, in the result. So which trait to choose as selection criteria and when to measure it? For sure, the definition of a postural activity uh, to target by selection, it's not straightforward. There have been a number of studies um, regarding the uh, possibilities to breed for cell behavior. Stratetal uh, stated an index, so uh, with farrowing duration, activity, risky behavior of the cell, and it correlated um, with the piglet vitality. So this is of interest. Also, the cell's postural reaction to the sound of a screaming piglet has been studied by several researchers. And this test has been under the scope of many phenotypic studies and connected uh, in many cases with piglet mortality. So the postural reaction of the cell is irritable. The cell reaction to a screaming piglet is uh, genetically correlated to piglet mortality. Stronger reaction, lower mortality. And in particular, L. Bruge et al. estimated the, the irritability for this trait 
um, also at three weeks after farrowing, and the genetic correlation to be late mortality was rather high. So it, was, it is always questionable at what time to make the record. And um, also, questionnaires in which the farmer summarized the observation of sow's um, behavior during farrowing and lactation can be an alternative to time-consuming behavioral tests. So this way, Van Gogh et al. assessed maternal behavior on a scale from one to seven. And looking at the use of different postures uh, by the so, we see that it can be particularly effective and there is a genetic root to those behaviors. Activity of in interest for selective breeding exists. But the studies I mentioned before rely on many hours of observation and notations on farm. And so convinced that sow postural activity could be a lever to improve several features of lactating cells. In uh, our group of research, we are heading for diotic and so standardized assessment of so sow postures. <clears throat> so first we considered image segmentation uh, from video data, and the is 1.5% to discriminate between the four postures. And so the recourse to artificial intelligence with neural networks next showed to be extremely powerful at discriminating between the different postures of the cells. It was realized with use of several neural networks and we reached a global accuracy of 97%. Real, so real-time monitoring looks feasible. Analyzing instantly the sound postural time budget looks possible, so we will be able to ensure standardized automa automatic records on farm. And it should be highly advantageous to capture with a good, with a good accuracy the genetic components underlying those traits. The sound posterior activity would be used primarily as a proxy for health problems, and in practice, video analysis can be used by the farmer to detect health problems. Valentina succeeded to analyze crushing of piglets at the genetic level, but it was very lowly irritable, so it is difficult to target directly. Instead, the sow carefulness toward piglets is of the utmost importance to avoid crushing, so it refers to one maternal behavior of high importance. An ideal behavior would be before lying down, the sows carefully check if there are many any piglets in order to avoid crushing them. Using a questionnaire, uh, Van Gogh uh, estimated the irritability at 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, which is promising. But as said earlier, there are physical factors that may impact the behavior of the cell, and they should be accounted for in the analysis, like leg problems. Ged et al. evaluated maternal ability uh, three, five days after farrowing on a scale from one to five by combining uh, several aspects described here. And so the irritability was rather low, 0 0.05, and they likely intended to summarize too many information at once. Besides, artificial intelligence makes it possible to lift the barriers to traits that are difficult to measure with the human eye. It could become possible to measure phenotypes as fine as the time needed for the cell to lie down. So let's pass on of my group referring to the improvement of social behavior, which depends on two facets, to reduce the negative interactions and to favor the positive interactions. And uh, the work targeting aggressiveness during mixing has highlighted genetic variability and moderate irritability values. So there is substantial irritability that breeders transmit. Uh, it shows that the breeders transmit this behavior to their offspring. And these findings indicate possibilities to use social behavior or trade. For aggression at mixing, it's necessary to establish dominance relationships between the animals and to, it has benefic effect in the long term. It reduces aggression in the long term. Conversely, strong aggression outside of mixing period is problematic. It may be relevant, as with poultry, to distinguish between the light contacts, which allow pigs to adjust their hierarchical positioning, in a gentle manner from the several attacks. And in the end, uh, reducing negative interaction and favoring positive interaction may be um, uh, referred to a subtle equilibrium. 
So uh, different pools of genes are likely involved in the causation of these two categories of social behavior. Um, for recording, simple grid of observation or high-tech video analysis are needed. And we need it to uh, identify the victim and the aggressor, like previously said, for the poultry. So the difficulty lies in obtaining the individual records. The mm -hmm. step further is to say that uh, negative interaction between pigs do not necessarily relate to aggression. The exploratory behavior is central in the activity pattern of pigs. This animal exhibits a high level of foraging activity, and differences arise when the animals difficulties arise when the animals do not fulfill their exploratory needs. Then they get frustrated, and it may turn into activity oriented towards the group mates, which can cause injury to conspecifics. It's referred to as damaging behavior. Indeed, the limit between normal and negative behavior is seen. A normal behavior that consists in gentle contact, pushing others smoothly, may turn into biting. These deleterious behaviors can be expressed in a wide variety of breeding contexts. For example, tail-biting in pigs is observed in buildings and towns, in conventional and organic systems. So it can be recommended to eradicate biters from the population. We know that there is breed variation, and what is complicated is that an animal may have a genetic predisposal to bite other pigs, but it will express only under certain circumstances. It is highly dependent on the context. So the behavior is that it's a complex causation, including both environmental and genetic aspects. Like I said previously, uh, we need to identify both the victim and the aggressors, and we are longing for technological tools to do so, eventually through video. The assessment of damaging behavior is intricate because it relies on the dynamics of the group. Its expression in, is group dependent, meaning that by removing an aggressor, another pig in the group may therefore become aggressor. Again, a pig may never express its genetic potential if the group composition is not favorable to it. So the social interaction can have profound effects on the group performance. And like I said before, we can refer to the models with social genetic effects to account for the social partner's identity. So the contribution of social effects to irritable variation are reported to be remarkably high in pigs too. So we can take benefit of it for genetic improvement of the populations. We expect a large impact on the response to selection by considering these effects too. So the first study is aimed at studying the performance traits, especially growth rates of pigs with a con for social interaction. And um, with this model, what we showed was that the social pigs, so the pigs with a higher social breeding value for growth, are those that initiate more fights at mixing uh, and bullies. But then they calm down and uh, correspond that uh, to less active pigs in the long term. So they are beneficial to the group because they, they enable to, to establish the dominance relationship between the pigs. Also, these social pigs show to, to have reduced tail, to produce less tail biting and other oral manipulative behaviors. So in many aspects, uh, it is relevant to select for growth accounting for this, those social genetic effects. Previous studies evidence substantial genetic basis to the biter and victim statue of pigs. As you can see uh, in the right uh, corner, the, bite, the irritability for biters can be up to 0.27. And for the victims with a direct model, it's 0.0.6. And when accounting for the social genetic effects, it's um, increased to 0.40. In a recent paper, we propose new statistical methods to better model these infrequent and sporadic behaviors and to predict who are the victims and aggressors within a group. The social network analysis, which quantifies the position of individuals in a social context and the flow of information within the network, allows for the definition of new, more integrative phenotypes of behavioral interactions. By combining the genetic models that exploit the degree of relatedness in particular with analysis of behavioral interactions between individuals, 
it will be possible to analyze more precisely the determinism of traits linked to social interactions and ultimately to select breeders to reduce the frequency of aggressor or victim individuals within the populations. Um, another difficulty lies in the fact that the pig's behavior is governed by its genotype and influenced by the environment. So G by o E occurs when the genotypes behave differently across environments. And it is mediated by the availability of food, the space, etc. They are particularly at concern when they induce a risk scaling of the genotypes across the environment. And so we identified important G by E with regard to damaging behavior in a Chinese European population based on the analysis of television and assuming that the victims who receive bites exhibit uh, aberrant behavior because they remain motionless while a conspecific is severely chewing or even eating their tail. And so several sires uh, suffered from strong re-ranking according to their total breeding value, uh, as exemplified with um, those highlighted in red colors on the graph on the right. Others had a better profile. They were not necessarily those who were the best, but they maintained a similar ranking according to DBV and T TBV in the two environments. And so based on TBV rather than B DBV um, would increase either increase or attenuate the discrepancies between the two environments. And what we recommend would be to choose the sires that maintain both stable DBV and uh, total breeding value in the different herds. If one day we go for a selection against the gills that are tail bitten. So breeding against tail biting implies to account for GBE. This is possible, but needs to adapt evaluation models with social genetic effect and the account for GBE. And so the GBIE partly explain why it is so complicated to control the outbreaks, outbreaks in, in this uh, matter. Um, <clears throat> the challenges, um, well, in breeding for behavior are numerous. The understanding of the genetic uh, mechanism leading to the expression of a given behavior remain complex. New sources of variation are highlighted with the progress of technologies. So image-based recording methods and sensor keeping track of peaks individually in a group paved the way for considering behavior in selective breeding. Still, much work is needed to validate behavior as a possible lever to improve performance and health and welfare. The behavioral traits differ from many other traits in that they are changed by experience and learning. Social experience in early life influence social skills in adulthood. Also, as mentioned earlier, epigenetics contributes to the transmission of phenotypic variation across generations. And um, <clears throat> we have access to new technology, molecular technologies that offer uh, to dig into the genetic roots to uh, damaging behaviors, extending the phenotypic approach to the fine analysis of molecular pathways in those type of behavior. Also, um, it reflects to, it refers to a complex genetic determinism involving several genes, some of which are linked to dopaminergic and serotonergic system. And finally, the omics approach may allow to detect non-invasive biological predictors, and this information can be used to choose breeders through genomic selection. So there, to finish with, there is evidence that genetic uh, solutions do exist. The environmental modification may not be sufficient to prevent uh, the abnormal social behaviors. So what we, is needed is to combine improved farming conditions and practices with genetic improvement of health and welfare through the behavior to improve the life of the pigs. And I would like to thank all the funders of this work, uh, INRAI, who support us, the experimental teams, um, and um, the group of Net Construction, as well as the Institute Carnot, who, who fund the WATSO project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lorian. Um, I have some questions here in the uh, Q&A box. Um, so, uh, Rose Salbe is asking, uh, how does farrowing duration relate to sow behavior? Um, 
So during the farrowing, the sow spend most of the time uh, lying. So um, I, I am not sure we have, um, at least at the genetic level, much information about that. But it seems like uh, obvious that the farrowing duration uh, relates to um, more time spent lying on the site for the sow. This okay. needs to be studied further. Yeah, and with the new technology, we will learn more about that. Mm. And uh, seeing in uh, Tingness, uh, do you think you would find higher heritabilities if the same studies were done on sows in a free farrow system? Not exactly sure what what uh, heritabilities, but um, mm -mm. If, if the situation was different uh, in a different um, environment. Mm. Let's say that um, in a free farrowing system, there is there will be an exacerbation of the maternal behavior uh, of the cell. So we, we we will express more variation in the posi uh, in the traits we are studying. So potentially, yeah, we 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 can grab. Uh, and then the more genetic variation um, and ending up in different irritabilities. This needs to be studied. Mm. But of course, you also have this situation of a G by E that the E is now totally different. So it may not be the same trait you're the measuring trait at all. That, uh, mm, but truly. of course, if, if you're selecting for the free uh, uh, system, you, you would benefit more for selecting on the right trait, correct trait, right? So. Yeah, but, but there is really a need for the farmers to, to progress uh, and they are eager to, to, um, to look at into activity of the animals, even if they are in a crate, because yeah, it's the basic situation that we need to handle and um, it can already uh, help us to find the good cells. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> once we have more, Farrowing pens, yeah, we will maybe have a different uh, genetic design, breeding design for farrowing pens. Yeah, Signe also has another question about the results. I think that uh, Durok was uh, showing more tail biting or ear biting or rope biting or uh, something that mm -hmm. um, it's, it's usually as a sire line where land race and large white are maternal lines. Do you think that can explain some of the difference between those uh, breeds in damaging behavior? Um, I think, yeah, it is um, a really complex determinism that is underlying this kind of traits. And we find it in different populations um, and in the same breed, according to the, the the environment in which it is raised, you, you will determine different, um, yeah, uh, well, the expression of the genetic expression of the traits does not already happen. So, so we find different uh, results even in the same uh, breed or type. Hmm. <laughs> and there is uh, also a, a rather classic question from uh, um, Maite Mathis. Um, so um, should one perhaps not adapt the animals to the conditions, but rather uh, adapt the conditions uh, to, to the animals? And, and the uh, he wondering about the ethics, um, whether the, how, how much of adaptation of the behavior through breeding to fit into management conditions is ethically acceptable. That's a, you've never heard that question before, I suppose. That's a really <laughs> classic one. Yes. Yeah. And like I, I intend to conclude with is that we need to improve the, the farming conditions for these animals. It's the first thing to do and uh, make sure that they have the possibility to, to express most of their normal behaviors and their, their needs, uh, social needs. And um, yeah, once you, you are satisfied with this, uh, decreasing the density and so on. It seems like there are some problems that we don't solve with the environment. And then it's when the genetic can uh, give solutions. Yeah. 
And I, I truly think that for complex traits like that, many of environmental uh, um, solutions have been tried. And then it shows that um, we need to target the genetic basis of the traits if we want really to, to modify, uh, reduce this program. I also found it interesting parallel between your and Ethers, Esther's uh, presentation that the direct heritability was lower than the uh, uh, indirect heritability. So it's, it's really also in this situation, you should not blame the victim, so to speak, but it's, it's, uh, it's actually selecting for the, for the social genetic effects that will make more progress on, on the to on the whole trait is that and esther if you have any comments you're also welcome to to chime in hmm. yeah it, it really seems like um, the use of these uh, social models um, is really relevant uh, so we grab information on the rest of the group and uh, and this is why yeah we we capture more variation, genetic variation that is related to the others. So, so this is why it, it happens like this, I think. And um, it depends of the modelings. Sometimes we observe a huge difference. So maybe in reality, the difference between a, a direct irritability and a total irritability is not so expected to be so large. But still, mm -hmm. we show definitely that we really improve uh, the, yeah, the, the analysis of these traits by and uh, accounting for these social genetic effects is really needed. Yes. Uh, well, um, we are coming towards um, the end of uh, this webinar. Um, and I would uh, like to thank all the speakers, of course, and also EAP for making this uh, uh, possible. Um, it's really difficult to, to summarize uh, everything that people have, you have been talking about. Um, but I think um, it's quite Interesting if you th think of all the talks uh, from Per Janssen's uh, through the more specific uh, of Esther and Loyan, that I mean, the environmental conditions for animals have, have changed tremendously over time. I mean, first you have the domestication, which presents a totally new environmental niche for, for some animals at least. Um, and then much, much later, these animals are subjected to a very strong directed selection for improved performance, whatever you want to, to call it, whether it's growth or, or uh, any other trait. And then a changed environment that basically is trying to be as uh, allowing as possible to, to, to that performance. Uh, and then after we have seen the negative consequences of, of that environment on health and welfare. We now try to give animals a more natural environment. And then ironically, it sort of comes back and, and bites us in the tail, uh, literally in the case of pigs. Um, so as, as you said also, Lorian, I think it's, it really teaches us that um, breeding and environments should be considered jointly uh, to make sure that the, the animals are suited for the environment, but that the environment is also suited for, for the uh, animals. So um, you cannot uh, look at uh, only one component. You need to, to look at uh, the whole picture. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to thank uh, everyone who has contributed. There are more questions in the uh, in the chat. So um, if 
we uh, do not leave Luian, uh, for instance, yet, uh, but you can try to answer those questions uh, as well. But otherwise, I would like to uh, uh, say that this uh, webinar is uh, now concluded and uh, thank you very much for, for being here uh, and uh, listening to uh, these talks. Thank you very much.